food is starting to smell really good back there. I know I'm excited about it. Um, and, and so I talk, speaking about food, Rachel baked a chocolate cake not too long ago. And you know, I like chocolate cake. And um, we had some guests coming over that night, so I couldn't touch the chocolate cake, right? So every time I went to get the chocolate cake, I was going to get a spoon across the hand or a frying pan across the head or something like that, right? And so essentially she prevented me from using that chocolate cake resource pretty effectively, right? <laughs> so that's kind of what we're trying to do with cheatgrass control, whether it's uh, grazing, whether it's herbicides, every time it reaches for that chocolate cake, we're going to try to whack it across the hand with something, right? That's, that's, really, that's really all we're trying to do is stress it, reduce it from using those resources, right? It's an annual. If we can prevent seed set for multiple years, hopefully we're going to deplete the seed bank. Anywhere from maybe five to ten years, if we could com completely prevent seed set from that population for that long, Theoretically, we should be able to get rid of cheatgrass, okay? So we're just going to talk a little bit about strategies, and then we're going to have you guys kind of group up and go through a couple scenarios. Um, tactics versus strategies, I'm not going to belabor this point. Tactics are I'm going to go out and I'm going to use six ounces of plateau to control cheatgrass. Strategy is what do I want this to look like over the long term? How am I going to get there? How am I going to manage grazing? Do I need to reseed? A lot of those different questions. Um, we're going to try to focus, we talked about tactics more already. We us try to focus a little bit more on strategy here and then also a little bit more out into the field. Management principles could apply to any kind of weed. Right? It's not just cheatgrass specific. If we can prevent the introduction from seed into areas, that should always be a priority. Um, no brainer. Collect, correctly identify the target weed, or you might make the wrong choice for your management strategy. Um, understand the distribution of the weed. If you're working on a 40 acre parcel, you're probably going to have a pretty good idea where your cheatgrass is, right? If you're managing an allotment, if you're managing a district, um, you probably need to know where you need to implement your treatments. So understanding that distribution, I'm writing you guys' way. Um, evaluate the current status. We talked about that earlier um, and trying to, to estimate recovery potential. Um, choose an option, implement, evaluate, and continue to monitor your results. That way you know if you can go back, you need to do follow-up treatments, if you're actually making progress towards the goals that you set. Um, I'm not going to go through this a whole lot. We've talked about this some. The, there's an invasion continuum that may range from completely weed-free, we don't see any cheatgrass there. I'm just going to go through pretty quick. Starting to get some cheatgrass come in. Uh, here we're getting even more on this side all the way to something that looks not very attractive for what we want. Right, at least from the surface, it's all cheatgrass. We make the assumption that this is a cheatgrass monoculture with not anything in it. We're going to take a much different approach than we would have down in this stage. Right. Uh, one of the principles that we know is if we can catch populations when they're small, not very dense, catch them early and do some control, our probability of success over the long term is much greater. And we're probably going to have to invest a lot less time and a lot less money. So this seems to be the, the predominant mindset these days is we can control cheatgrass long enough to allow our perennial plants to recover or if we're planting them to establish or to grow in hopes that those perennials and the competition that they exert on the system will reduce cheatgrass over the long term. That seems like pretty, you know, as far as a paradigm for managing cheatgrass, it seems about as sound as anything that we've got right now. Um, I, I already mentioned earlier, I don't think we're ever going to create a system that's completely resistant to invasion by cheatgrass. We're just wanting to limit the impacts um, the impacts that we see that are affecting our management objectives. One of the things that we haven't talked about is reseeding those cases where we have no desirable plants left. Um, that's harder to see than I thought it was. So places where uh, productive rangeland has been completely dominated by cheatgrass, maybe where we can get a seed drill in there um, and do some good, potentially following wildfires if we know that there's a, a limited availability of seed. Um, one of the, the patterns that has sort of tended to, to hold up is that the seeded species that do well and compete the best are also introduced species. 
um, things like pubescent wheatgrass or crested wheatgrass um, and, and we're trying to do some more research to evaluate some more native species. Hopefully next year Holden's going to have some more information on some, some species that we can recommend that will help us get native plants established um, to try to compete with cheatgrass. Another thing I just want to touch on really briefly is this idea of assisted succession. Um, this was developed in Utah, places where cheatgrass monocultures are not uncommon, right? And just the, the quick thought process behind this is we use a competitive grass to capture the site essentially from cheatgrass. Something like crested wheatgrass has usually been used. Um, after that grass becomes established and by competition reduces the cheatgrass load, then we can potentially come in and augment that diversity by seeding other species. Sounds like it makes pretty good sense. So if we look at this from sort of a theoretical perspective, um, if this is our vegetation system kind of up here at a high level where we want it, diverse, it's producing a lot of good forage, something happens, maybe we get a fire, we get disturbance, and that system goes to a degraded state, dominated by cheatgrass. It's not providing very many ecosystem services that we want. Grazing's been reduced. We can invest a lot of money and a lot of time if it's actually crossed over a threshold and then that, it's not going to go back to where it was, right? We're going to be stuck in a cheatgrass system, potentially. Or we may have some kind of secondary invaders. So assisted succession adds a little step to that in that our little system here can potentially go through an intermediate state, right? It's not a fully functioning diverse ecosystem, but it might be providing something more than a cheatgrass monoculture does and then in hopes that after that we can go back up to um, that level that we were pre-disturbance. Uh, we'll touch on this a little bit more out in the field. Density and the size of the infestation will probably inform if not even dictate um, your management strategy. So a small low density infestation um, you might be able to hand pull it. Right? We said it's easy to kill. If you got it in your, like a lawn on windrow or something, um, you could potentially hand pull it. Uh, large, high density infestations, thousands of acres. Um, we're talking about maybe uh, long term restoration efforts, right? Some of you guys are working with something like that and just getting that strategy to fit the situation. And then after lunch, we're going to try to consolidate in as many vehicles as we can. Um, go look at a site. We've got a couple different research trials, but I'll, I'll say it's not really all that interesting to see the research part of it yet because I just sprayed them yesterday. So there's not going to be a whole lot of stuff going. But if you want to come on the field trip, um, we're going to talk about assessing some recovery potential stuff, um, evaluating your vegetation a little bit, look at two different scenarios. Actually, the two different scenarios that we're going to look at, uh, we've got a, a, a place that's got really high canopy cover for cheatgrass, but then a pretty good basal cover for perennial grasses. So there's some understory there that we think it's got good recovery potential. Uh, the other um, has got cheatgrass and annual mustards, real common mix, right? And um, you know, those two combined are like 99% of the canopy cover. And then the big negative potentially with this site is I don't see a whole lot of desirables down in the understory. So we'll, we'll look at those, see what they look like. Um, and then you'll see the site when we get things posted up on the web, we'll let you guys know next summer when I go out and collect data, then we'll put some videos up and you can see what they look like.